Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Waits. I'm here with Pia Sorensen. Uh, we're both at Harvard. And this is a public lecture series that's associated with a course that we teach on science and cooking. And so there are probably some new people who normally don't come to this. Uh, usually, uh, maybe I give you a little bit of a background. Uh, this is a course that we've been teaching for, I guess this is the 11th year. Um, and it started uh, with uh, some chefs uh, from Barcelona re region in Spain. Um, they visited Harvard, um, Ferran Adria visited Harvard, and uh, from that this course was born. Uh, and each week as part of the course, we have a chef visit us uh, at Harvard to the course, and uh, we also uh, share that with our neighbors in Cambridge by having them give a public lecture. But with the pandemic, we can't do that, so instead we're doing everything by Zoom, and we want to, again, share our uh, discussions with the chefs uh, with everybody, and now because it's by Zoom, we can share it with everybody in the world. Um, the tradition for the public lectures is that the chefs will tell us about the wonderful things they do, but since the class itself is about science and cooking, a P and I have a little bit of introduction where we talk a little bit about the science that we do, uh, that we discuss in the class to try and put that in format. And you'll see, uh, you'll see that we have a certain uh, number of traditions which we will ask you to uh, join us with. Uh, let me say at the beginning that uh, these lectures are sponsored by uh, the uh, National Science Foundation through the Harvard Material Science uh, Center, MRSEC, as well as some companies in uh, Barcelona, Gastronomy, 1933, 33, and Nascata, and uh, Brad and Taylor Shimadzu, uh, who both um, uh, support uh, part of the course. So uh, this week, uh, the next slide, uh, this week we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, Andoni Luisa Duras and Ramon Perize uh, but from Mugaritz Restaurant, uh, the chef and the uh, director of fermentation and R&D. And uh, we are uh, looking forward very much to uh, learn about this. Uh, uh, I'll say uh, you'll hear when Pia talks that it's Fermentation is one of her great uh, expertise. She's a real expert on this and uh, loves uh, to talk about it. Uh, but we also do a lot of things with it. And um, just to uh, set the stage for everything, on the next slide, uh, you might ask, does this have anything to do with fermentation? And this is a graph. This is the kind of thing that we show in our class. And we are going to ask everybody to uh, participate and we have a poll. The question is, does this graph, what does this graph represent? Does it represent the number of COVID-19 cases in New York City in March, 2020? Does it represent the number of microbes in sauerkraut as a function of time? Both of these are a function of time. Or does it represent both of the above? And uh, please uh, uh, answer the poll and let's see what everybody thinks. Please join us. The poll should appear on your screen. Uh, it's both in uh, English and in uh, Spanish. About uh, half the people have uh, tried to tell me what the answer is. I'll wait just a minute more. If you think you know, please tell us. If you're not sure, please choose one or the other and we'll discuss both of them. Please join us for the poll. 
we like to hear from everybody who's listening or watching. Okay, so there's still people adding. Did we stop? Yes, okay, so here's the results. Um, about two thirds of the people said it's one and two, it's both of them. 30% um, correctly identified the growth of the sauerkraut, 3% correctly identified the growth of the number of cases of COVID-19 in New York City, and two thirds of everybody correctly identified, in fact, the correct answer that this is in fact both the number of cases in, um, of number of cases of COVID-19 uh, in New York City uh, at the early days, and it's the growth of the microbes. And here's uh, just an example of that on your right, we see some sauerkraut and uh, as we start to prepare it, the microbes which do the fermentation are starting to grow. And on the left, uh, we see the growth of the number of cases in New York City. That would be the same whether you do it in New York City, in Madrid, uh, in France, anywhere. This is really what we call an exponential growth. And this is, uh, the, let me see if I can draw it. This is the equation that we use for exponential growth. You see there's an exponential here and it starts with some number and this is telling you the number as a function of time. And this constant K is just the half-life. It it's how, how long it takes for the number to double and it just doubles in every time tau. And this is a science class, so you would think you wouldn't see equations in uh, when we talk about cooking, but we do try to uh, have equations when we talk about cooking. And our tradition in the uh, class is that everybody should clap. So please join us and clap your hands. Everybody who's watching, please clap your hands. We like to see equations. Okay, so that's the science of what we're talking about. On the next slide, I think Pia is gonna tell you some more about why it's important for food and the differences in the type of uh, um, fermentation that takes place. So Pia, please. Thanks, Dave. Um, so sometimes I start this lecture by asking everyone, so um, what do all these foods have in common? And usually since the sort of name of this week is fermentation, everyone is like fermentation. So I'm not gonna ask you that today because um, you're gonna be very active in this lecture anyway, because there's gonna be a lot of polls, lots of questions from Ramon and Andoni. But let's pause and just look at this picture. All of these foods, all of them have been in some way or another transformed by fermentation with the help of microbes. And it, it, the, the sort of diversity of flavors you get thanks to these microbes is, should really sort of stand out as you look at these images and think about what all these foods taste like. I mean, everything from the kind of um, uh, strength of a soy sauce, the richness of a soy sauce to um, fermented meats, olives, tempeh, sauerkraut, all kinds of cheeses, just the diversity of cheeses. Um, there, there are some real interesting fermented ones here, like the Icelandic hakarl, uh, which is fermented um, shark. All of them have been transformed by microbes. And that's what the sort of theme of this week is. So this theme, this week really kind of marks a bit of a philosophical shift um, in our series. And I say that because usually when we think about cooking, we think about cooking with heat. We think about all the transformations that happen in food because of heat. Um, so we cook an egg, we boil things, we fry things. In this lecture, we're talking about all kinds of cooking that you can do with microbes. And so the philosophical shift is really that, as you all know, um, heat 
usually kills microbes. And in this case, we do not want to kill the microbes. In fact, we want to create an environment where the microbes are striving, are, are thriving, and, and sort of happily transforming food for us. So a lot of recipes, a lot of fermentation recipes are kind of have, they include steps that, that are, are aimed at um, creating this very special environment that keeps the microbes alive as opposed to kind of just killing them. Okay. So I'm gonna start by asking you to take a deep breath. And um, I, 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 I uh, as I was preparing this lecture, and even now as I tell you, I, I have this feeling that there are all these people, there's like several hundreds of you out there listening to this lecture, and all of you right now, you're taking a deep breath. So take a deep breath, and then breathe out. Like a real yoga breath, a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And you keep doing that, breathe in and out. And as you do that, think about what molecules are you breathing in and what molecules are you breathing out? What molecules in, what molecules come out? And as you continue breathing, keep breathing. It's a good cleansing exercise anyway. Um, think about what happens to your, your lunch, depending on your time zone, your lunch, maybe even your breakfast, maybe your dinner, as you're breathing in and out. And of course, the answer is that as you're breathing in, you're breathing in oxygen, you're breathing out carbon dioxide, and in the process, your body is using the oxygen to transform the energy that is in the food into energy that you can eat, I'm sorry, into energy that, that you can use, um, that you can use just to stay alive, uh, watch Zoom lectures like this one, clap for equations, and do all the kinds of things you do. Okay. So now you've been breathing for a while, and I'm gonna ask you to now take a deep breath in, and now hold your breath. And keep holding it and holding it for as long as you can. I can't see your faces, but this is usually the point in the lecture where people start to see, look really sort of strained, and they're like, I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna show her that I can hold my breath for a really long time. Okay. So if you haven't stopped already, please stop now. <laughs> so how did that go? So what I'm guessing is that it probably didn't go so well. And at some point you had to basically give up and take a deep breath. Right. But if you were a microbe, and in fact, if you were one of the microbes that are usually responsible for transforming our food in food fermentations, you would happily just have switched over, or in fact, you would maybe have preferred that way of metabolizing anyway. And you would just have sort of continued to metabolize your lunch without any oxygen present. Okay, so this exercise is um, inspired by my colleague, uh, Roberto Coulter, who I teach a class with. And basically to summarize, so what you first did is called respiration. This is a process of using oxygen to transform the glucose and turn it into uh, energy and out comes carbon dioxide. And the other mode of fermentation is called, the other mode of, of metabolism is called fermentation. So really what the word fermentation means is the sort of the biological word that we use to describe metabolism when it happens without oxygen. So these days we use for the word fermentation as a way to just describe what happens, what we do when we transform foods um, with microbes, right? It, it refers to that process. But originally it comes from the fact that the microbes that do that for us are using that kind of, of metabolism. They're using fermentation as a way to metabolize. So there are two main kind of players in food fermentations. And I just want to introduce you to them. The first is any kind of alcoholic fermentation. Um, these produce carbon dioxide and ethanol. And the other one is any kind of lactic acid fermentation. So this is the kind of metabolism that happens in your 
uh, muscles when you get really, really tired. It is also the kind of metabolism that happens in lactic acid bacteria when you make things like yogurt or cheese or pickles. So the most common one is summarized here. The most common kind of yeast, the most common um, alcoholic fermenter is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, takes the sugar, transforms it into carbon dioxide and ethanol, occurs in beer, bread, wine, and many others. The other one is lactic acid fermentations, uh, which is by these bacteria, things like lactobacillus, lactococcus, also take sugar, carbohydrates, and they transform it into lactic acid. And this, this includes any kind of fermentation from kimchi to sauerkraut, yogurt, cheese, and many others. So those are kind of the two main ones. There is a third one, which I, is, I think is especially important to mention before this lecture, which is any fermentation that happens with molds. And molds are multicellular uh, fungi. Uh, they grow these um, filaments, which this beautiful apple here is actually covered with. And um, they also transform foods in various ways. Um, they um, occur in all kinds of traditional food fermentations, but they're also one of, I would say, one of the hallmarks of the fermentations that take place at Mugaritz. And in, place, in fact, when we went uh, for the last few years to write our book on science and cooking, which is coming out in October, we will put a link in the chat if, you, if you're interested in pre-ordering it. Um, when, we, when we put this together, when we wanted a really awesome example of the kinds of things modern chefs do with mold fermentations, we reached out to Ramon and Andoni, who were like, please, please, um, could we include one of your recipes? And they very generously and kindly said yes, and, um, and this is the recipe we're including. And so if you like this kind of stuff, um, then there's more of that in, in this book. Okay, so... This is, I think, the perfect segue into my introduction of Andoni and Ramon. Um, it's a real, real pleasure to have both of them here. They've actually visited this lecture series once before, several years ago, and we've been really eager to have them back, and now, now it all worked out in, in COVID times. So Andoni Luis Aduriz is the chef and owner of Mugaritz, and Ramon Perise is the director of fermentation and the head of R&D. And together with the rest of their team, they are behind Mugaritz, which is really, I think, one of the places in the world that are really pushing the boundaries on innovation in haute cuisine. They're also really pushing the boundaries on what, on the diner experience of what it means to eat, what does it mean? What, what is food? They're constantly having this sort of philosophical discussion. And um, I think what we're going to be exposed to today is a real deep dive into just the crazy creative stuff that has come out of their kitchen. So please join me in welcoming Ramon and Andoni. Bueno. Un, un placer estar con, con vosotros. Eh, de hecho, no es un placer, es un gran placer, es un privilegio estar con vosotros y poder compartir conocimiento. Eh, supongo que alguien me va a traducir. Ramón, ¿me vas a traducir tú? Sí, yo soy. I will be the translator tonight. Ok. Entonces, eh, lo primero, eh, oye, daros las gracias a todos los que os habéis apuntado, que sois muchísimos, eh, porque para nosotros... Eh, es importante lo que hacemos, pero también es muy importante que poderlo compartir. So it's a big, big pleasure to be here with all of you tonight, and I want to thank everybody who is watching this uh, lecture because uh, sometimes we feel, you know, maybe wrong that what we do is very important, but to share it is more important. Bueno, en, y luego lanzaros dos ideas, ¿no? Dos ideas. Eh, para poner en contexto, quizá, ¿no? eh, lo que vais a ver ahora. La primera idea sería explicar que más allá de, lo que, de la forma 
de la mirada que podemos eh, posar, la mirada que podemos posar so, desde el punto de vista técnico, um, en el fondo nosotros estamos haciendo un ejercicio de, de cultura, un ejercicio que está muy vinculado con lo, con lo cultural. Uh, en Mugari nos interesa mucho más esa perspectiva eh, multivisión eh, de las cosas, ¿no? So, first of all, I want to deliver two ideas. The first of all is to say that beyond the technique, uh, we are very focused on the cultural side of the gastronomy of the food in Mugaritz. And uh, we like always to share with other disciplines our work because um, gastronomy is, is something with a lot of many different phases. So you can, you can watch to gastronomy from fermentation or from sociology, from anthropology, from whatever, engineering and so on. Bueno, la, la, quizá explicar que el ser humano ha hecho cultura de la basura. Um, yes, so we want to, to explain how the human beings made culture out of garbage. Ok. Cuando se nos estropeó la leche, aparecieron los quesos. Cuando se nos estropeó la fruta, aparecieron los vinos. Se estropearon las manzanas, apareció la sidra. Cuando se nos estropearon las gachas, los cereales, que en inicio se comían solos, después se comían triturados, aquello fermentó, apareció el pan. Eh, es algo que hoy en día, desde la perspectiva convencional, donde todo caduca, no hubiésemos podido acceder a todo lo que después nosotros no solamente nos lo hemos comido por necesidad, sino que además eh, le hemos, eh, le, lo hemos tratado de comprender, de comprender los procesos y llevarlos a la expresión más amplia y seguramente más excelente de todo aquello que en inicio eh, fue un problema, ¿no? So, the, the main idea is uh, when the, the milk spoiled, we had, uh, we discovered the, the, the cheese, when the, the, the grapes spoiled, we discovered the wine, when the, the apples spoiled, we discovered the, the cider, and nowadays where everything, you know, all the products one day or another will be out of date, okay, we, maybe today we didn't have the chance to discover The, this kind of uh, this kind of fermented food. So now we try to understand what's happening, and we try to make culture out of it, and we try to bring this fermented food to the expression of excellence. Y luego la segunda idea que me gustaría compartir es que um, la mirada que normalmente tiene Mugaritz es bastante poética. Es decir, más allá del proceso. Eh, más allá del resultado, nosotros no podemos evadirnos de lo que nos ayuda a contar, de la intención de las cosas, de las técnicas, de los procesos. Y esto es importante porque vais a ver que se hablará de técnicas, se hablará de procesos, se hablará de muchas cosas, pero es que en el fondo todo oculta una vocación de construir un relato. So, uh, the vision of Mugaritz, or the way that Mugaritz understand gastronomy, is always uh, poetic. So, beyond the processes, beyond the techniques, beyond uh, uh, the results, we always try to build this uh, poetic vision in Mugaritz. Mm -hmm. Bueno, disfrutar mucho de este curso, que os puedo asegurar que... Solamente es una pequeña parte, porque Ramón ha tenido que esforzarse no para contar, sino para, para saber qué contar, para quitar material de todo lo que, de verdad, de todo lo que traíamos, de todo lo que podíamos llegar a contar, pero que lógicamente el tiempo nos limita. ¿no? En cualquier caso, disfrutarlo de corazón. Eh, sé que le vais a sacar mucho provecho porque Ramón es una de las personas, eh, yo creo que en el mundo de la cocina, que más sabe. De, de todo lo que tiene que ver con las fermentaciones. So, uh, Antonio says that thank you so much. I hope that I'm, I I know that you will enjoy this lecture because you know uh, he knows me very well and I had a problem with that presentation because I like to speak to, to I like to speak very much and I like to show 
everything that we, we made here in Muaritz with all the team and the problem was to, to choose what to explain and what to show. So here you will see tonight the result of around 10 years of uh, working uh, with a team, 10 years of experimentation with uh, fermentation. Disfrutar. So much and enjoy. Thank you. Gracias, Andoni. Gracias, Ramón. <laughs> well, so let's go. Uh, so I will show the screen now to show you um, uh, the presentation. I have to say that, that before the uh, few minutes ago, I have been speaking with Patricia to organize everything. I have a few things to show here in, in Mugaric. I'm in the development and research kitchen right now. And, and in that process of uh, uh, tell and show, maybe we will go straight to the tell and after we will show everything. And then we will have time to, for the questions and, and, and maybe for the answers. Okay, so let's go. Thank you, everybody, to be here. Okay. It works. Perfect. So we call to this uh, lecture uh, fermenting brains because as you, as, as Pia said, fermentation is transformation. And that's what we try to do here in what is we try to transform okay the brains to transform the the, the way uh, to look okay to gastronomy so whoa problems okay okay let me see Okay, are you gonna share the screen again? Compartir pantalla here. It's working? It's working? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So first of all, <laughs> I want to show you what is, this is more, it's a little, a little place in the middle of the mountains, in the middle of the of the nature. So it's placed here because uh, 22 years ago, Andoni, uh, looking for a place for uh, his restaurant, he found that place which was the cheapest place in the area. So we start here, and it was a little bit far away from San Sebastian, but nowadays is is a very very as you see is a very beautiful place and. The surroundings always have an influence in your work. This is an oak tree. Just to note that Mugaritz is a, is a word in Euskera made with Muga, which means age or border, and Aritz, which means uh, oak tree. So this old oak tree, uh, 200 years old, more or less, is in the border between two villages, between Errenteria and Astigarraga. And, and this is very important because we try to put that idea of border of age in our philosophy in gastronomy. We like to be in that thin line, in that border, in that age between the good and the bad, the salty and the, and the, the taste and the untaste. Okay, it's not uh, easy to be there, um, but, but it's, it's the way that we choose to, to go with our gastronomy. So this is the table in Muaritz, uh, the stage. is always naked when you arrive to the restaurant because we understand that the, the guest is the one who has to build the whole experience, is the one who has to discover everything. This is part of that poetic way to understand gastronomy. Our kitchen uh, with the team. And here we have uh, where I am right now. This is the development and research kitchen. We started with that kitchen in 2007, 2008, and it was a big step 
beyond in our creative process because here we have everything to develop creativity. We have the space, we have uh, the time, and we have the team. We have the, the development and research team, uh, which is, is very important to, to go beyond. So what is Muaritz? Muaritz is a, at least is a context. It's a context to, to be creative, it's a context to develop your creativity. And here we try to give all the tools to everybody, to ourselves and to our guests to be more uh, creative. So I always try to, I like to say that if, if everybody is more creative, the, the world be, will be a little bit better. Because to be creative, you are you have to be in the in the good mood. So maybe it's important. And this is what we try to do in 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 Mugaric with our guests. Note, but in that uh, different pictures, uh, he is our our mate uh, Javier, the part of the of the development and research team. It's not the, uh, these, these faces are not talking about deliciousness or happiness, all of them. Some of them are talking about doubt, they're talking about fear, are talking about suspiciousness. So that's why we try to do one here. We try to create that, you know, these different emotions, different emotions in our uh, front house. So that's the question, why, why fermentation? Uh, during the during the the lecture the presentation you will see a few uh, few questions and maybe some links to books or papers related to the explanation here is just to ask do you ferment something at home something at home yes or not so i see here no no, uh, 60%. So, whoa, the people ferment a lot of things at home, which is very, very good and very, very interesting. That's good. That's good. So the next question, I cannot do it, maybe is, uh, is what you ferment, but here is the other one. Why we ferment nowadays? Uh, to, ferm to preserve our food, to make our food tastier, to make our food healthier, to make our food stinkier, or to preserve our culture. Here we go. To make our food tastier is the winner, is it? Yes. Somebody thinks that we we love to make our food stinkier. So yes, uh, that question, uh, to be honest, it doesn't have the, a right question. Could be all of them, at least. But but yes, uh, nowadays in the in gastronomy we ferment food uh, to use it as a, a taste enhancer. Yes, but uh, in the history, as Andoni said before. Uh, to eat was something very dangerous, extremely dangerous. Okay, so, uh, you know, little by little, we have been learning what to eat and what not to eat. So, um, here we have some fermented food, very traditional cheese, bread, apples, cider. And here we have a, a mother of vinegar, Okay, from a friend of us. And uh, the, the, the smell and the taste of fermentation is the smell and the taste of our culture. So this kind of food, we have to learn to eat it and to enjoy it. So it's part of this uh, ongoing process. Okay, it passes generation to generation. It's very interesting because the root of the, of the word culture is the same for, for, for cultures related to microbes. And here this is one of the oldest uh, food enhancers, which is the garum. The garum is the, 
let's say the the the, the fish sauce of the Mediterranean. And a few years ago, we we start to producing our own garum here in Moari. It's made of anchovies, sardines, uh, bonito, and different uh, different fishes. Later on, I will show you um, how we prepare our garum here in Mugaritz. Okay, we, we, we prepared the base a few months ago. Okay, I have here one barrel of, uh, of garum and I will show you uh, how we prepare it. Uh, here you can see the, the book, the Reco Quinaria from Apicius, in which you can see the garum in around, uh, the, the word garum appears 461 times. So, Almost in the in all recipes, you have garum. Use it as a um, let's say taste enhancer, taste enhancer, or maybe to cover the bad taste of the food because uh, they don't have uh, freezers and things like that in the in the Roman times. Here you can see a few pictures about how we prepare the garum, and one question: Is the garum a truly fermentation? So here we go, 25% no. Uh, well, uh, that question is very interesting because in, uh, I asked this very question to Sandor Katz one time. Uh, is the garum fermented food? And, and he told me that yes, it is, it is. Um, it's very interesting because uh, in, that, see, in the Encyclopedia of Gastronomy, of one of them, which is called uh, the La Luz Gastronomique, if you watch after the description of uh, fermentation, there's a word okay, uh, called ferments. So the transformation made out of microbes and ferments. And if you look, the definition of ferments is related to the enzymes. So when you transform something with enzymes, okay, you can consider this food as well fermentation because fits in the definition of fermentation, transformation. In that case, in that case, we can discuss that later on, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, here you can see how we prepare the garum. In that case, we use an all, all recipe in which we add uh, aromatic herbs to the preparation. Okay, um, we don't do it like this right now. We skip the herbs, okay? Because uh, with the herbs in the garum sometimes get ruined and we don't like this, okay? It works perfectly, but sometimes we fail with the herbs. So, which is very important is to use the fish, to cut the fish, if you use the whole fish, to put in contact all the enzymes from the intestines with the uh, protein. Blend this uh, fish with salt and let it go. One month, two months, three months. Okay. If you are on a hurry and keeping in mind that the process is made with enzymes, you can put this uh, garum in a hot box, in, in a hot box around 40 degrees, 45 degrees. And the process uh, we just made in maybe two or three months, it will happen in, in around 11 days. So this is one way to, you know, to enhance the speed of uh, transformation in that case. So uh, back to, the, to our history or our relation with the uh, fermentation uh, when we bought this book in 2000 i'm gonna say in 2000 around 2010 2011 it was you know like uh, spectacular what we discovered in that little book from santos wild fermentation okay we discover all this world okay so we we, we never hear about risopus or koji or kombucha or nat no natoshi or amasake or kimchi or the rice balls and so on 
So we found something to play here in the development and research department, and then we start, okay, to play with the microorganisms. And since 2011, uh, we developed so many iconic different dishes based on the technique of fermentation. So, and as, as Tony said, if there is a sick state, it is the taste of histories. And this is our will to explain histories through fermentation. So to use fermentation as a metaphor, okay, to talk about terroir, to talk about transformation, to talk about uncertainty, to talk about doubt, control, or complexity. So open your mind, not only your mouth. This is a quote from a, for a nice book, uh, right for a journalist called Josep Pla, the cuisine of a country, it's the landscape in a dish. So here you can see um, a rock painting okay, from Valencia. The people say that is a woman collecting honey. Other people say that this is an astronaut with, uh, you know, uh, spaceships. But uh, the point is that uh, to, ferment, uh, to ferment honey, you only need water and the honey, a little bit of water or humidity and the honey. And it seems that the, the meat, the meat was the first uh, alcoholic beverage, maybe, who knows. Uh, a few years ago, we started to produce meat here in Mugaritz. Very easy. We blend water and honey. Then we expose this mixture in our garden to the air just trying to collect all the, all the, it is a kind of a romantic idea to collect all the yeast floating in our garden. And then we ferment this meat during 30 days to 25 degrees, very, very slowly, to finally have this uh, meat. What we try to do here, here we try to express the idea of terroir. So the expression of our landscape, how to put your, the landscape in a pot, how to put the landscape in a beverage, maybe through this yeast. So it's very well known that uh, in the different cellars, they have their own kind of, uh, of flora and, and, and yeast. And this yeast brings the, let's say, the character to the drink. And it, it is very, very, very important at least. There's an experiment that uh, Diego Prados used to make, and which is very, very interesting. I cannot do it right now, but uh, I can explain to you. If you prepare water and sugar, okay, a syrup made out of water and sugar, and you prepare two pots. In one pot, you can put yeast to make beer, and the other pot, you can put yeast to make uh, champagne, okay? After fermentation, you can taste both, okay? And one will taste like a beer and the other one will taste like champagne. And it happens because uh, the yeast. So this is how important, okay? The experience is very interesting for me because it explains how important is the yeast in the taste of the, of the food. But the terra is a little bit, the, the idea of terra is, is beyond that. For me, the idea of terra, the terra, the idea of terra is the expression of the land, the expression of the microbes in that space, the expression of the people who is working uh, with the product. So for me, the terra is, you know, is that complete idea. This is the, the dish that we made. This is a, a bread soaked in that uh, bread soaked in uh, honey meat fermented with the yeast of our garden, with the flowers in our garden, and uh, ice. Here I have to show you another meat. So uh, two years ago, we had the idea to preserve uh, sea orchids in honey. So we, we, we take a kilos and kilos of honey to submerge uh, sea orchids in that honey. So we serve the sea orchids and then we keep the honey. So with that honey, aromatized with sea urchins, we prepared a meat. So here we have, you know, the sea urchin meat, which is very, very interesting because you have this 
two layers okay of terra the terra from the sea and the terra from our garden so the biofilms um uh, for me the this this idea that you can see here I sh we saw this in in a in a laboratory this is a a petri dish with this uh, medium called PDA potato dextrose agar in which the the scientist uh, used to to grow uh, these bacteria another question you the thing do you think that our society is becoming bacteriophobic? Yes. <laughs> I think I think with all this uh, this problem that we have right now is is it's absolutely true that we are becoming a little bit bacteriophobic. Sometimes I used to think in this uh, in these um, uh, sci-fi movies uh, with the invasion of the of the ovnis and the, you know these little microorganisms are the ones who save the humanity. So maybe we have to to keep that idea in mind. So here when we saw this in the laboratory we realize that potato, dextrose, and agar is something that we have already here in the restaurant. So why not to grow a microorganism on the top of this gelatin? So yeah, we try to do it. We make a apple puree uh, with a little bit of gelatin, and then we sit uh, a rhizopus, uh, a rhizopus uh, oligosporus on top. Yeah, which is the uh, the mold used to produce the tempe, and it grows perfectly, and it creates that uh, amazing uh, biofilm that looks like a carpet. Very very tricky. So here I will show you a little recipe about how how we produce this biofilm. So very simple ingredients, simple steps. First of all, hydrate the gelatin. We, we like to sanitize all the surfaces with ethanol before working, trying to skip this cross-contamination that we have sometimes here. So mix the agar with the lemon juice, heat it up until 90 degrees. Try to strain it to remove the lumps. Add the gelatin and spread it in trays. And here we are seeding our tempe. There's little tips here, like to make holes in the plastic, which are very, very important. And here we go. So later on, I will show you this carpet. I have one here. So this is something that, that was very interesting. It seems like the surface is hydrophobic, but it isn't. One day a friend of us measured the, the angle between the drop and the surface and they told us that it isn't uh, hydrophobic. So here you can see how we invest our time in, in, <laughs> in the laboratory here. Okay. Well, so transformation. 
Okay, here we use that that carpet, okay, that mycelium made out made out of uh, the rhizopus to make that dish. In that case, this is a lamb loin smoked with a uh, eucalyptus bark, uh, lamb juice, and this here we we try to mimetize the wool of the lamb, okay. And the idea of transformation, which is very important here uh, in, um, you know, in, in this idea of transformation related to many religions, you know, if you note in the Catholic rituals, they use the red and the wine uh, and the transformations in blood and, 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 uh, and body, okay? And both are fermented food, which are have been transformed before. So here, uh, we write this article for the full magazine in which we explore the cultured foods for the body and for the soul and the power of transformation in the modern times. So here, uh, for me, a very interesting question. My food choice defines my identity about... So you have different percentages, 10, 25, 50, 75, 100%, 0%. So understanding identity, okay, as 75%. So yeah, your food choice, to choose your food sometimes is a way to make politics or to show your identity, which is, is, is very, very important. Okay, and you can you can bring this idea to many different levels. The easy one to see is a is a religion. So here in 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 Europe and East Europe, so Western Europe, uh, we have so many dishes related to that identity. Well, here you can see what happens when an apple falls down of a tree. Okay, here in Moage we are surrounded by uh, apple trees. Okay, because in that place there's a lot of cider houses. The cider houses are here because uh, many years ago in the, 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 the Basque sailors needs the cider, okay, to travel very far away because the, the cider has a lot of vitamin C and they can Skip the the scurvy. Uh, that's why th this is the big advantage of the Basque sailors in those times. So here we have a lot of apples. That that you can see this this picture very easily around here. What we did is to grow this uh, rhizopus in these little apples, these wild apples called chalacas here in the Basque country. So. How we did that? So we took that apples, we peel it a little bit, we blanch it in water, okay, and then we sit our rhizopus on the apple and we let it grow. We serve that bite with a drop of vodka just as a little appetizer at the beginning of the at the beginning of the menu. And this uh, apple, this apple, yeah, um, bring us straight to this idea. I will show you now a video. So you will have the link to the, the page of the artist. This is a video installation made with some some tailor, some tailor boot, and uh, and it's called Still Life, Still Life, and speaks about the time, about the past of the time, and and about the as well again the transformation. And now I will show you a little time lapse of our little apple.
with that little dish, we, we, we reach two different things. One thing is this velvety texture, which was unknown in gastronomy. And the other one was to, to, to create that, that doubt in our uh, guest. Okay, we like to say that our guest has to be our accomplice because, you know, in a complicity, you know, is a sort of mutual understanding and, and, and trust in the other, almost friendship. So, to it or not to it? That's the, that's the question for us, okay? So, the question, where is the difference within between fermented and rotted? Fermented food and rotten food. There is no difference. It depends on your culture. It depends on your point of view. There is a difference. Fermented is good and rotten is bad. Okay, so fermented is good and rotten is bad. Well, for me, for me, uh, answer one, two, and three, all three are good. Even the fourth one is good as well. So uh, <laughs> there is no answers on here, only questions. So uh, to, to illustrate that, here you have a quote, a quote from a, from a paper in which an anthropologist speak about the use of uh, uh, putrid meat in the Paleolithic. And it's very interesting because he say that if you look at, uh, if you look at a dead body, okay, uh, 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 how is it called? A doctor will say, our forensic scientist will say that uh, the process that is happening in that body is putrefaction. And, uh, food, uh, uh, and a food scientist will say that the process that it will happen that is happening in that body is a uh, fermentation okay so sometimes it depends on the point of view sometimes it depends on the culture yes because uh, it happens that when you visit japan the first time that you taste the natto okay is something terrific or even when the japanese people comes to europe and you show them these blue cheeses that we have around here it's terrific as well so um, um, it's, 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 something, it's something very interesting, it's very interesting. Um, at least depends as well on the culture, yeah? Uh, coming back to the Garum, in the old times in the Roman Empire, uh, it was forbidden to sell uh, Garum, wine or um, oil to the barbarians. Okay, because uh, this transformed food was the difference between the barbarians and the people with, you know, with culture. So, so yeah, for me, is the culture is is the main thing on that case. So, let's go. Pelicillium nalgiovense. So take a look at the pictures. What is this? Is fermented or is rotten? Rotten, 39%, fermented, okay, the rest. Well, yes, is fermented. In that case, is one of the, for me, from my point of view, it's one of the most delicious things in the world, which is the jamón ibérico. Okay, to visit a place where you have the jamón ibérico is amazing, amazing. Each, each camera that you can see has a different smell, a different flavor from bakery uh, to bread uh, and so on. It's incredible. And you have all the flora growing on top of the of the jamón and giving to the jamón all the character and protecting the jamón from contamination. So nowadays the, the industry is working with that, uh, with that uh, molds just in order to protect the food 
And we took one of these molds called Penicillium nalchiovensis to grow it on top of the meat. And here you can see um, uh, cow meat with Penicillium nalchiovensis and uh, little drops of uh, capers water. So uh, this, is, this is another way to take advantage of the microorganisms to preserve our food. Here a little. That kind of penicillium used to grow on top of the pork meat or the pot sausages. And it was very interesting because when we grow that malt on veal, the veal tastes like pork. It was very, very interesting how we can create this new animal, which is the, the veal with that fungus. So the penicillium roquefortis is very well known uh, for the Roquefort, yes, which is the, the blue cheese made in a kind of blue cheese made in, in France. Here are some pictures which are beautiful. So there's a, this, 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 this wall, this micro wall is amazing. So one question, which basic taste protect us from spoiled food? Yeah, the sour one. Yes, the sour protect us from spoiled fruit and protect us from unripped uh, fruits. So, so that's the next question. Here is the picture. Would you eat this if I tell you to do it? Well, well, <laughs> muy bien. Well, 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 well. Again, just for a little bit. So uh, many people trust me. Yes, this is the first time that we grow Penicillium roquefortis on bread, on bread. So how we did this? Uh, we 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 bought we bought in a cheese supplier. Okay, the starter, we dilute that starter in, in milk and then we soak the bread on the milk. Why I, I asked you this? Because in those times I have been working with a chef from uh, New Zealand and, and she did all the process, but she didn't taste the bread until I tasted it in front of her five, six, seven times. Okay, so uh how it looks that bread is very very interesting and how you think about this which is what happens when you forget the bread on top of your freezer inside a plastic bag okay it made us to think how we can provoke our our guests how we can create that thought okay how we can uh, you know create this kind of jump of faith to eat the food that's the dish. Okay, later on I will show you. We prepare that brioche, which is a brioche. We use a drench to inject the smoke inside the brioche and to make it grow. And it looks like a spoiled, spoiled bread. At least, it tastes really good because it's like to eat brioche with uh, blue cheese. So it's a kind of uh, of a synthesized uh, blue blue cheese sandwich. As well, uh, as well, it's very interesting because we have full control about this bread. 
we try to to let it grow okay just randomly because it seems that it's natural but we can uh, let it grow we can make it grow okay in different patterns so we have full control about this mold when we make that dish so how we made this in that case is another one for first of all we sanitize we dilute a few drops of the starter in milk we soak the brioche in milk and then we let ferment it and we have that uh, superficial growing of the mold Sometimes it happens that we have cross-contamination and we have to be able to realize okay, if this is good edible or not for the human beings. So here you will see the patterns that you can create growing this penicillin or the fruit is in a base of uh, yogurt. Which is, is uh, hypnotic. As well, it's possible to grow these, uh, these penicillin brocifortis on fruits. Okay, so how we do that? In that case, is a pear. So the technique is to take the pear, peel it, and then we put the pear in a calcium bath just in order to create a, a, a surface, okay? So the calcium reacts with the, uh, pec the, the pectins of the fruit to create a new uh, pectatos de calcio. So it is a second skin and, and because it becomes a little bit harder, allowed us to cook for a long, 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 long time the fruit without losing the shape. So. After the calcium bath, we use the amount of 2% calcium per one liter of water, around three hours. We cook that pear in a lactose syrup for a long, long time until the, until the inside is melt. Then we put that pear, we submerge that pear in our diluted, diluted uh, starter Roquefortis and we let ferment. And then we have that pear that looks like a spoiled pear, but at least is a, is a pear with blue cheese. We fill the pear with a, with a foam made out of a, a pear uh, distillated. Sometimes it happens that, uh, you know, the mold goes wild and, and, and looks very, very interesting. I took that picture because I like to ask to a microbiologist if it's edible for the human beings when this, this, this mold goes wild, and it is. Then the Penicillium candidum. Here we jump from the Penicillium roquefortis, which is the blue cheese, to Penicillium candidum, which is the, the, the mold that grows in this kind of uh, cheeses like brie, uh, Camembert, San Marceline, San Felicien, and so and so on is a is a is a white mold. Yeah, here you have, you can see some pictures of this mold, which are amazing. And the first time that we grow the mold was on bread in 44 hours, uh, 29 degrees. We have this uh, beautiful, you know, and fluffy uh, bread which was very interesting and tastes like, uh, like cheese. And then we start to create, to develop a dish. So using the same technique as the Petri dishes and, and using a blend of heavy cream and milk and gelatin, then we can grow this mold on top. It happens that when goes wild, creates a lot of gas and makes this kind of cloud, which are very interesting. You know, but it's a little bit too much. Here you can see how the enzymes are melting the gelatin absolutely under this uh, surface. It's amazing. I have to say that the taste is a little bit bitter. It's a little bit bitter. So one idea was to grow this cheese straight on the dish. So we start playing and at least we did it. 
we grow the mold straight on the dish. Here we can see the dish. Whoop. Here it is. So, how made the dish uh, so special? Think about it. We have the gelatin, the mold on top, and then we serve a cryo concentrate of apple. And what happens in, uh, is that we put the dish in the oven or in the microwave, a few seconds, the gelatin melts completely. And when you touch the surface with your spoon, it breaks down and then a kind of a white liquid uh, comes up and blend with this uh, apple juice. And, and it happens that you don't know how we did it. And it creates you that, you know, that, that, that idea of doubt of our sense and uncertainty, which is, is very interesting to feel that, that, that to feel this in a, in a table. So creativity has made the rules, no masters. Botrytis tinerea. Here I have, I think is a, we have a question on here, maybe. This is a, this is a grapes with, a, with botrytis that you can see in different parts of the world. The question is, what's the difference between the noble rot and the grave rot in grapes? There are different molds, the weather, the use of pesticides. There are different molds. I think Botrytis tinerea could be in the noble rot and could be the gray, uh, the gray rot. In the case of the grapes, depends on the weather. On the weather, yeah. Uh, to create these botrytis uh, wines, you need a humidity in the morning, and then you need a dry weather and wind in the afternoon. Okay, if you have humidity the whole day long, the noble root becomes the gray root, and you lose all the crop. Yes. So the conditions in which the mold grows, okay, define one name or other. So keeping that idea in mind of control, let's say how we can control the nature and we develop that ditch, which is the botrytis. In that case is an apple and we serve that apple with four different wines made out of uh, botrytisette uh, um, grapes from the, the four zones, the four famous zones around the world, which are France, Austria, Germany, and uh, Hungary. Hungary. Here we have the, the apple. So the, the look is very challenging. We fill that apple with a um, marmalade made with orange and different spices because you can find orange marmalade, no, the aroma in all the different wines. That's the the silver thread between uh, the wines. And the point is to eat this is very challenging, but we have full control over almost full control over this apple, but we don't have control over the wine. Okay, because we are on the hands of nature. If the nature is not, you know, the weather is not good, we can lose everything in the vineyards. So here, this, yeah, we're still speaking about uh, wine. Here we have the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, different species, Beticus, Ceresiensis, Motuliensis, Roxy, which are the yeast, here we have yeast, the yeast, who grows on top of the sherry wine. So this is the biological breeding. This yeast feeds itself from the sugar and the glycerin of the wine. That's why the sherry wines are the driest wines in the world. So what we try to do, 
we try to grow this floor yeast here in Mugaric. So we have been in touch with the, with the enologist of the, of the sellers in the south of Spain, in Jerez. They give us the floor yeast and as well they bring, they, they give us a little bit of, uh, of wine. Okay, here to select the microorganism, we use the alcohol. So here we need a uh, uh, 15.3 degrees of alcohol to select that, uh, that yeast. So we try to do it here in Mugaris and yes, it works. It grows. It grows, but uh, dies very, very fast. That is very very fast because the you know the amount of wine has to be the correct one. At least we 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 not master the technique, but we understand what we have to do to grow our floor yeast here. It's very delicate. The temperature is very important, so we have to buy you know uh, aire acondicionado. No sé, Patricia, si me puedes ayudar. No sé cómo se llama aire acondicionado en inglés. Está bien, está bien el condition. Eso es. To, to keep, you know, the temperature in the room to grow that yeast. And this is how it looks when it's well, well grown. In, in that cellar, uh, in that cellar, one enologist told us that, that he he'd see itself as a micro farmer because his main job is to, is to take care of this yeast because the yeast makes the wine. So here, Antonio Flores giving us the day that he gave us the floor yeast. Queremos entregarte parte de nuestra alma, parte de nuestro ADN, ¿okay? que es nuestra flor. Yo llamo florita, nuestro, nuestro, nuestro ser vivo, en la que obra el milagro del vino vivo. Así que te enseñamos y confiamos en vosotros y en el equipo de Mugari para que creéis con ella de la this project of grow the flow yeast here was very very challenging and 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 not too easy we had a very uh, a lot of problems of con cross contamination and a lot of problems to to keep the temperature and the and the right amount of nutrients inside the the wine. So the, the scale the scale of the wine and the yeast is very very important in that case. Different dishes that we make with the floor yeast. Here we have a black olive brioche with the floor yeast, and here we have a freeze dry foie gras with the floor yeast, which is very, very interesting dish. We used to serve that dishes with the, with the cherry wine, in that case, uh, the Jerez, Tio Pepe. And then to finish, I want to speak a little bit about the, the kombucha. So that's the question. Do you like to drink kombucha? Yes, no, I only drink Grand Cru. I like this 8% that only drinks Grand Cru. <laughs> no, I ask, this, I ask this question because now kombucha seems to be very uh, trendy and there's a lot of uh, kombuchas. In the United States, there's a big, big market of kombucha right now. Different dishes that we made out of kombucha, but I have to say that in Mugaric, we are focus on the SCOBY, this symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast that create this matrix made out of cellulose. So we grow uh, kombucha in so many different 
let's say, um, um, substrates, not only tea. We use um, uh, sweet purees, we use the um, heavy cream, we used soy milk, we used uh, even um, jamón iberico stock to grow kombucha. And, uh, and the final result is always uh, very, very interesting. Even uh, potato, um, potato juice. So here you have the, how it looks. Normally the kombucha, so we, we always have been focused on the surface, on the SCOBY. So that's the SCOBY. Basically, as a cellulose. So, in 2014, it's very interesting because I received a tiny piece of kombucha from Germany. Okay. Uh, I have been in touch with a guy. I don't know that guy, but he sent me a piece of kombucha with a little bit of liquid by, by using the postal service. And uh, the first the first time we saw that that thing, uh, uh, it seems that it's not working. But in a few years, we we will be able to create this this uh, this massive kombucha who who, who, who was with you. We, we use it as a tablecloth. So different test in different teas. Uh, using different in ingredients. So here in development and research to develop different, different tests is very important. And finally, we found in a book in Philippines, there's another SCOBY called Nata de Coco. And they sell that Nata de Coco as a candy. And what they do is to take that, uh, that mother, that SCOBY, called nata de coco, and uh, they cook it in a, in a sugar syrup. So we had the idea to put our scoby under and between sugar. And what it happens is that the texture changed completely and becomes something like a, a, like a jelly bean, like a gummy bear. Different test. And then here, we realized that we can grow this uh, scoby on a fruit puree. In that case, we used uh, uh, strawberry puree. After this, we cure that uh, scoby in a blend of sugar and freeze dry strawberries. And then we make that ditch, which is the strawberry scoby with uh, heavy cream. Yeah, which is an interpretation of a very traditional uh, dish, which are the the, the strawberries with a, with a heavy cream. The, the year later, because we are very creative, we did it with the reverse. We, we grow the scoby on heavy cream and we made a, a cream of uh, strawberries. So one year was uh, strawberry with cream and the other was cream with strawberries. And here I show you the process in which we decide to grow kombucha on uh, soy milk. So we realized that in many, many products in, in Asia, the kombucha was used as a clothing agent. And we try to use it here as well, and it works. If you blend uh, kombucha and a little bit of mother with uh, soy milk, okay, it sets completely, it jellifies, I guess, because the the acidity. But what happens that on top starts to grow this kind of uh, scoby, which is transparent, and the taste is very is is a very interesting sourness, and the texture is very um, liquid. And then we develop that dish, which is a, a little anchovy, roll it in that scoby. So it's a version of very traditional dish we have here, which is the boquerones and vinagre. And 
the adjust. Almost to finish. A ten lap of the rowing. And just to finish two more things that we had the last days, the last years with the kombucha. This is the, the kombucha tissue. So here, what we have is to put flowers on top of the surface of the kombucha and then that cellulose keep these flowers inside. So, and then we can serve that little blanket made with the scoby and the flowers. I'll show you how we made it. So this is one way to keep, to trap these flowers. And finally, this is the, the last dish that we made this year with our SCOBY. So uh, it happens because the COVID that we had to close the restaurant a few months and our uh, SCOBY start to go absolutely completely wild here in the restaurant. And we have a scoby thick like this. We put that scoby in sugar and it becomes something incredible. We serve that scoby cured in, in sugar with a full spoon of a sauce made out of a, a algae a miso and is absolutely incredible. The clash of this uh, salty and sugary and 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 sour bite is incredible. So, um, as, as, as this analogist uh, told us in Jerez, uh, here in Mumbai, we don't have chickens, we don't have, uh, you know, there's uh, farm animals, but we are micro farmers. We have our little microorganisms and we try to, to you know, to, to grow it, uh, trying to understand it and, and trying to control the temperature, the pH, the oxygen, the humidity, and as well the nutrients, which are the key to grow uh, this microorganism. So here I finish the, the, the telling part and I, I will show, I will pass to show you something if you want. Thank you, Ramon, this is great. Um, I think so. I think, in the interest of time, we should we should you should show us a few of the things because I know you've prepared them, and then we'll do a super quick uh, Q and A, and then we'll wrap up. Does that sound good? Yes, yes, perfect. We can we can show and and speak at the same time, maybe. Oh, okay, okay. You're you're ready to answer questions as you're moving over. Yes. Okay. I, I would. Um, in that case, I have I have several questions on the same theme, which is not surprising to me. Um, which is, uh, I'll, I'll pick Alexander's question: How do you know if something is edible, especially when dealing with microorganisms? Um, there's other. How do you know if it's suitable for human consumption? How do you test? How do you how do you determine if it's edible or not? How do how do you do that? Yes. So. 
Um, how I know that? Well, there's, there's a movie I like to show, which is called um, Running. It's a movie made with the director is John Frankenheimer, and it happens in Paris with Robert De Niro, and Reno, and so on. It's a spider, is a spider, uh, a spy movie, okay? And they are uh, Robert De Niro, no? Bob De Niro and General, they were in a in a in a in a car, and the the conversation is is one asked to the other in the under the bridge and the river. How did you know it was an ambush? And the other say, the first thing that they teach us is when there is a doubt, there is no doubt. If I doubt if something is edible or not, I throw it to the garbage. This is the first thing. Um, the other thing is that we always use a uh, fresh starters or commercial starters. So if I expect something velvety, blue, and with the smell of Roquefort, it has to be like this. If it's different, I know that something happens on between, okay? And as well, we, we have here, we have a, a department and we check all these elaborations all the time, just in order to see if we have cross contamination or we have, you know, we can check through the literature if we have toxins, okay, or not inside the, the different dishes. Yes. Great, thanks. Sometimes, sometimes you have to experiment with yourself. So here you can see. Okay, so the first thing I show you is how we make the garden. So here I have a barrel, yes, it's like this. And here we put anchovies and salt, and it was here for around five, seven more, and this is how it looks, okay? Look. Smells, smells fantastic, I have to say. Well, and now, I will show you the final result, because this Sunday, I saw that they were straining the garden here. Or Jeff were straining the garden. So here we have our garden. And this is the garden. Okay, I will show you a little bit. So how clear, how clean it is, is impressive. So because at the first time it looks like a rotten pest, rotten, rotten uh, paste, but you can see here that the final result is amazing. So here we're still having some scraps of fish. Whoop. So, Pierre, do you have questions? Actually, I do have questions about garum, which fits perfectly here. So, how can how long can the garum stay for? 
And what is the oldest garum that you own? Whoa, the oldest garum that I own, I don't know exactly, but you can keep the garum almost forever. Okay. <laughs> almost forever, yes. Because the amount of salt that we use here is around, let's say, is around um, uh, 50 percent, 50 to 20 percent, which is a huge amount. And the main idea is to try to skip the Clostridium botulinum. So, okay, more than 50 percent is saved. Okay, and with it, with this this amount, we can keep the garum almost forever. Here is how we keep our garum. For example, that one was 150 grams from the 12th of September 2020. Was trained a few days ago. Look, here, this is the honey meat that we produce here in Mowari, it's made out of the honey in which we keep our sea orchids. Okay, it's very aromatic. Oh, something happens. Yes, yeah. It just stopped. It just stopped, yes. Yes. Maybe try to share again. I will. In the meantime, maybe as you get ready, I've seen a few questions which I feel very eager to answer. So maybe I'll do that. There's a question from Renan Rourke about what would be a good starter recipe for fermentation to prepare with younger students? Um, and there's some questions about good recipes to do at home. So when I do this with younger students, uh, and really any students, I, um, two great ones is sauerkraut and yogurt with, for both of them, you sort of don't really need anything. Both of them are such traditional fermentations that if they go wrong, you kind of know that they went wrong. As long as they, as, as long as they smell fresh and, and sort of look good, uh, what you did is probably good. So those, I, those two I really recommend. Um, they're very simple. For yogurt, you can just use backslop, like use a non-pasteurized uh, store-bought version. Just put it in some milk, put it in a warm place and wait uh, for sauerkraut. All you need is some salt, some cabbage. Really push out the, the, the oxygen and the extra air and you should be good to go. Okay, Ramon, what do we have? Here we have the tempeh growing on a, um, a lemon gelatin, okay? I will cut it a little bit to show you. I don't know if you can see. We'll cut it a little bit. Oh, look, look, that's better, look. So here we have and here you can see how melts the gelatin. Oop, here. Here. So then after this, we dry this, uh, this mold and then we serve it, we serve it with lamb, okay? So another thing that we have around here, pretty interesting is the moldy bread, the forbidden bread.
So here you have a red, I check it. Okay, so yes, it works here. Yes, yeah, so here you can see the holes that we made. So I will cut it from here in the hole. So the point is if I serve this to you in the table, you will eat it because you are here in Mugaritz or not? Or you will call on Donnie just to have a few words with him. <laughs> so the technique is very simple. Yes, you can see here the malt as well growing outside. It's very important to have a beautiful, a beautiful hole inside the red just to able the mold to grow. If you check how the cheese maker make the, the Roquefort, you can see that they cut the cord very big, very big, and they don't press that cord just in order to create holes inside the cheese. Little holes with oxygen who you know, able the cheese to the cheese the mold to grow. Another thing that I have here, and I like to show you. So we have a very very hot weather on here. We prepare this dish on uh, on Sunday, yes, and is a little bit over fermented, a little bit over fermented, yes. This is the penicillium candidum growing inside a plate, okay. This is the plate, I will try to pour it upside down. So here you can see the inside, which is that heavy cream. Smells like cheese. Yes. So the main idea is to put that plate in the oven a few minutes to melt the gelatin. And now Okay, these are the fermented apples. Okay, here we have one that goes a little bit wild. Okay, I don't know exactly. I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's too wet, but I will show you one of them, like this one. So here you can see how we grow, in that case, the penicillium, the penicillium roquefortis and the penicillium candidum. Okay, it's very interesting because uh, there's a kind of competence between both molds. Okay, if you put, I guess, if I'm not wrong, if you put first the penicillium candidum, the Penicillium Roquefortis, uh, it doesn't grow. So the, 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 the amount of competence that we have around here is very interesting. If we put it upside down, you can see that we have a hole here and we fill that hole with the uh, marmalade. So you can see how the mold grows inside as well. And that one, it's 
So here you can see clearly that something goes wrong. Something goes wrong. And what goes wrong here, I think is the amount of humidity that we have. I can see it. So that one is super, okay, is overcooked. It's overcooked. Well, and I go with, I want, I want to show you one of our kombuchas. Yes, I have it here. This is our kombuchas, maybe you, you have it one at home, but the most interesting thing here is how big it is in that case. So here you can see how big it is. Then after this, put it in sugar. And what we have is this little thing around here. This is the scoby and how it looks. It's like a, it's like a gelatin, and the texture is is a, uh, is amazing. The texture is amazing, and the taste as well. So, this is. I have few more things here to show, if you want, but. Uh, I think in the in the interest of time, yes. I, 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 so I, I could stay here all night and, and I, I see many hundreds of people who could also stay here all night. Um, but I think um, we should probably wrap up here. And yeah. um, we have, we've taken some questions um, and I'm sure there are ways to get in touch with Ramon to, to ask your questions if you'd like to. Um, mm -hmm. So let's, let's all, join in thanking Ramon and Androni so much. It was amazing to have you here and amazing to see all the stuff you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Pia. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to have the chance to, to show a little bit what, what, we, what, we have do, what we have been doing during these years here in Moritz. Yeah, it's a big, big pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.